Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar hosted by SNIA Networking Storage Forum. Today, our topic is Networking Requirements for Ethernet Scale-Out Storage. And I want to introduce uh, today's pre uh, presenters. We've got a John King uh, from Mellanox. John is also SNIA and SF Chair. Uh, we have Sakib Jan from Chelsea Communications, and this is Fred Zen. This is the uh, moderator for today's presentation, and I work for Intel. Before we move into the topic, I want to give a quick introduction of SNEA, uh, Storage Networking Industry Association. It's a nonprofit uh, trade association um, actively working in the storage and networking industry. Um, SNEA got um, Focusing on the uh, developers and 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 promote promotions of the standard and technologies, and also SNIA provides education services to broad audience. Right now, SNIA is uh, uh, made of 170 unique member companies and has uh, 3,500 active uh, contributing members that reach out to a broad community of over 50,000 IT end users and storage professionals worldwide. You can learn more information about SNEA at SNEA.org uh, slash technical, and you can follow us on Twitter uh, at SNEA. Um, before we get into the topic, I want to pause here um, so that audience can read through the legal notice. Um, you can see um, We'll have the presentation and the uh, webinar uh, record on SNEA, uh, NSF, NSF website. Um, all the member companies and individual members can use those materials, um, but uh, please make sure you uh, cite SNEA as the source of the material and keep, and keep the entirety uh, without any modification. Also, I want to emphasize like the, the, the last line of this slide, there's no warranties and use the, the content at your own risk. Okay, um, let's move into the agenda items. What we will talk about at today's presentation, we'll start from the, the, the scale out storage solution overview. We'll define what is the scalability, scale out versus scale up. We'll talk about What's the driving force? Why, why we want to have this scale out solution? What's the, what's the kind of, why this is popular, popular nowadays? And we'll talk about different kind of you know, scale out storage solutions. And then we'll focus more on the network requirement for those scale out storage solutions. We'll touch east west traffic, the TCP in cast, different speed uh, in the stor storage network uh, environment and the load latency requirement for the internal communications. While the all-flash scale-out solution is getting more and popular, and we need to consider the, uh, the all-flash scale-out solution, storage solutions in the uh, Ethernet network uh, environment. So we'll touch on that as well. And then we'll summarize with the key takeaways. From here, I want to hand the mic over to John, John, please take over from here. Thank you. Fred, thank you very much. I want to start out with a quick discussion of what is scalability. When we talk about scale out versus scale up, uh, we need to you know, define what are we talking about in terms of scalability. So I'm going to say that for the purposes of this presentation, scalability is the ability to add capacity or performance or more users to a storage system so you can support an increasing workload. So when we say scale out, that usually means you add more systems or more hardware to one cluster. Uh, you, each additional piece of hardware system you add increases the performance or the capacity or both, uh, usually both. Uh, you can manage these multiple systems together as a single virtual system in one cluster, so the whole, you have multiple pieces of hardware connected together, but it looks like one system, and you manage it like one system. And there is often a cluster network or I should say there's always a cluster network which could be the same as the uh, regular network or could be a separate network. When we talk about scale-up storage, it usually means you add more capabilities to a single storage system. You can add more capacity or performance, maybe faster CPUs or more CPUs, but at some point you hit the limit and that single system cannot add any more. So then you've reached the scale-up limit of that system and you start adding more systems and you manage each, each system independently. 
So at a high level, that's a difference between scale out and scale up storage systems. So here's an illustration. On the left side, we have a typical scale up system, or actually four scale up storage systems. They're all connected to the, uh, the network which connects to the clients or the servers. And that's what we call the front end or client network. And the key is that each system acts independently and is managed separately. On the right, we have a, one type of scale out storage system. We have four storage servers or storage nodes, but they're all running as a single cluster and appear to be a single system, and then they connect to the network. And in this case, we do show two separate networks, a front end or client network to connect to the clients or application servers, and a back end or cluster network that connects the different storage nodes together. But again, in some systems those are uh, done on one network, and in some systems they are two separate networks. So let's talk a little bit more about scale out storage, first uh, how it works, and then why people might be using it. So scale out storage can refer to multiple types of storage technology. There's not just one kind. There are different types of, of scale out storage. There is, however, in almost all cases, a software layer that presents an aggregate view of the storage resources across multiple nodes. That is, there's software either on the storage systems or on the clients or both, which makes all those multiple storage nodes look like, again, one big storage system. You can add more storage resources, usually hardware. You can add capacity or performance and get near linear growth. Linear growth would mean if I have double the number of nodes, I have double the performance and double the capacity. And a near linear growth would mean if I double the number of nodes, maybe I get uh, 1.9 times more performance and 1.9 times more capacity. That would be near linear growth. And again, these resources are treated as building blocks for a larger storage system that can work across multiple nodes rather than having each node be treated as a separate monolithic entity or a separate system. So that brings up the question, why do people want scale-out storage? You know, we believe it's increasing in popularity. So what are the advantages? Why would I do scale-out storage instead of scale-up? And obviously people do both. But one reason is data growth. So everyone tells you that the data is growing quickly and the world is building exabytes and adding more exabytes every year. So certainly for one customer, it's certainly possible that the amount of data they have for one project or one data lake or one database grows beyond what a single system can handle. This is especially true if you have unstructured data or object data. This tends to be big and you keep it for a long time. So there's a good chance it's going to grow bigger than a single system can handle. So you may want a, a scale-out system where multiple systems act as one. There's also compliance requirements. Uh, increasingly, for different kinds of reasons, whether it's medical records or financial transactions uh, or you know, browsing records or security logs, there's a need to keep more data for longer periods of time, which means that you effectively have to store more data because you can't throw it away or can't throw it away for many years. And there are also requirements for disaster recovery. Sometimes compliance requires that you have copies of data, uh, you replicate the data and off-site. And you may need more than one copy. You may need two copies or a total of three, sorry, two remote copies or a total of three copies of the data to ensure that in case there's a fire or earthquake uh, that you're able to recover and restore your data. So you have more and more data and you may have to store it in multiple locations. And then from, perform from a performance standpoint, uh, there are several technologies and trends that are increasing the need for storage performance. For example, machine learning or artificial intelligence may mean that you have to access a lot of the data more quickly. Analytics may mean you simply are analyzing, accessing much more of the data or all the data where previously you only looked at just the recent data or just the, the data that had, was easy to interpret. Parallel processing says that many different compute nodes may want to access the same data in different places at the same time. Uh, so you may have many servers that are all processing uh, the same set of data or parts of the same data set. Uh, therefore, it's easier to have all that data in one big storage, uh, scale out storage system. And that's related to distributed access, again, for performance or simply because you have people in different offices or different projects. Uh, you may need to have people processing the data or different applications who are accessing it from different geographical locations. And therefore, you want a storage system that can store the data across multiple locations. 
From a cost standpoint, there, is the, uh, there are potential savings for on the acquisition cost and operational cost for scale-out storage. So some types of scale-out storage can, access, can leverage less costly hardware, meaning less cheaper servers and less expensive networking. We'll cover more of that in, a, in another slide. And uh, for many storage admins find that if they have many, many individual systems, uh, say more than 10 or some number, that it may be more expensive to manage them individually than it would be to manage one large scale-out cluster. Scale-out also usually lets you add performance and capacity at different rates, uh, which may be more flexible and let you only buy the, add the amount of performance or capacity you need rather than always adding the same amount uh, all the time. And you may, again, as we've talked about, have better data locality or access, meaning that there's a greater chance the storage can be accessed locally by the servers or users or applications that need it. So I said we were talking about on the slide, past slide how you might be able to save money or reduce costs. Uh, so with scale-out storage, you may be able to reclaim stranded DAS or direct attached storage capacity because the storage on each node can usually be used in scale-out storage anywhere in the storage system or by many or any client, where when you have local storage or individual scale-up storage systems, uh, you may have systems that have unused storage that it's difficult or impossible to have it be used uh, in another part of the network or by another client. You may be able to converge your data and storage traffic onto one type of networking technology like Ethernet and possibly just one physical network. And that would allow you to leverage Ethernet economics and commodity and possibly commodity servers as well. And the reason is that uh, many of the scale-out storage systems, not all, but many of them use Ethernet you know, for their cluster network or for the front-end network or both. Uh, that's not always true, but in, a, in many cases you get to very large scale-out systems, they're likely to use Ethernet. Uh, and also some of them, again not all, some of the scale-out storage solutions are software-defined ones that can run on commodity hardware, which may mean you can pay less money for the servers or maybe even use cheaper uh, SSDs and hard drives. Uh, to create your scale-out storage solution. But again, that's not true for all scale-out storage. There's certainly um, scale-out storage appliances that are branded and come all together prepackaged and predefined and are not on commodity hardware. But they're usually both options. So we defined how scale-out storage works, what are some of the advantages, and we said there's more than one kind. So here are some of the different types of scale-out storage that are out there. So first, you have clustered storage appliances. To me, this would be something like uh, the EMC PowerMax or the HPE 3PAR or the NetApp FAS or there are actually any number, or EMC Isilon. There are actually many different uh, solutions from most of the major vendors. We typically buy a set of appliances that you connect, that come with an internal network, they connect together, and they look like one big, easy-to-manage storage system. And it could be block or file or object or both. Some of them do block and file. But that would be an appliance from a specific vendor. It can scale out to several nodes, multiple nodes, and provide one big uh, system of storage. Then you have parallel file systems. These are systems such as uh, GPFS, now known as Spectrum Scale, or Luster, or BGFS, or Gluster. Again, there are actually many examples. But there's typically file systems that run across multiple storage nodes and sometimes um, have software running on multiple clients. So it again allows many different clients to access the same storage, but the storage is running across multiple physical systems, which gives it more capacity and more performance. But it again can look like one big file system. So I can share files or have, uh, even have different clients in different locations uh, reading and writing from the same file at the same time. Object storage uh, does not technically have to be scale out, but almost every implementation of object storage uh, is in fact done on a scale out nature where you have multiple storage nodes and the objects are stored across multiple nodes uh, for redundancy and access and uh, disaster recovery purposes. There are also distributed big data or distributed app other distributed applications. Hadoop is a good example, but not, of course not the only example. And in this case, you typically have data that's spread out across multiple nodes, which each do some compute on it. They store it, they compute on it, and then the results are collected or consolidated together. And then the process is repeated. So the data is so big that it is both the data capacity is so large it won't fit on one server, and the processing needs to 
to analyze that data, that big data, won't fit on one server either. So you distribute the data across many servers, analyze it, and then bring the results together and do it all again. And finally, you have hyperconverged infrastructure, which in most cases, maybe not every case, but in most cases, you have a series of servers. Each one has compute and storage, possibly a hypervisor, and each of them uh, will, it, sometimes they actually, uh, each node will access the storage on the other nodes, so you have distributed storage, and sometimes they access storage locally, but they replicate the storage to other nodes, again, for disaster recovery, uh, or in case you lose a node, you still have the data that existing on one or two other nodes. So hyperconverged is a type of distributed storage, which also includes the distributed compute. Now, there's, it's not possible to have a discussion about network storage today without addressing the issue of flash and other types of solid state storage because it's becoming so prevalent. Uh, obviously, capacity hard drives are still a large percentage or the majority of this, the storage capacity out there. But in terms of spending and in terms of performance, you know, flash is definitely making, uh, has been growing for several years. So if you have scale out flash storage, it lets you do centralized management of the flash as opposed to putting the flash storage in every server. Uh, it's usually easier to do the, the disaggregation and the management, again, as we talked about, by having one big system instead of having multiple storage servers with flash. And uh, this tends to, we've seen that this is usually popular with larger customers, uh, you know, hyperscalers, other service providers, either telco or cloud service providers, and large enterprises. Anybody can use scale out flash storage, but it seems to be more popular with the big customers. And then there's NVMe over Fabrics. While NVMe over Fabrics is not inherently itself either uh, confined to scale up or scale out, it does allow network flash to be accessed at, uh, with a similar performance to local flash. So that means that in many cases, scale out flash storage becomes more practical because I can access it across the network and get similar performance or sometimes the same performance as if it were local. So. Uh, what, what happens if we go to flash storage? What does that mean for a scale-out? Well, of course, the flash is faster than hard drives, so it's more likely the scale-out storage will be used for a database workload or other transactional workloads, which means that they often, well, and with flash you typically require either higher bandwidth or lower latency or both because you have higher performance expectations for the application and for the storage system. So most likely, you know, we talked about this network, uh, sometimes two networks that scale out storage has. When you go with flash, you're more likely to need a faster network. You're also more likely to mix network speeds. And Saki will talk more about what that means in just a minute. So uh, as I near the end of my section, we talked about the different networks and the need for this, uh, uh, sometimes for a cluster network. What is the network traffic that is in a scale out storage? You know, and why does it matter? Why is there, we say that there's more what we call east-west traffic. Uh, what is that and why is it going east and west instead of north and south? So north-south north, network traffic usually means from the application servers or the, the user, individual uh, desktops, to the storage. That's usually, roughly speaking, what we mean by north-south traffic. East-west tends to be between servers or between storage controllers uh, or between metadata servers, but it's going between storage nodes, uh, to the, which is usually left and right or east and west in the diagrams, where up to the clients is usually up and down or north and south, just the convention of the way these diagrams are drawn. So this type of scale-out storage traffic uh, is usually used for either distributed data access or data protection and uh, coherence of data, making sure the data is consistent across nodes. So for, from the distribution standpoint, so first of all, I may put the data across multiple storage nodes or multiple servers to get better performance. Again, we talked about sometimes scale out means I have more, I need more performance than one server can deliver. So I could spread the data across multiple servers and access the data, those multiple servers simultaneously to get the performance I need. I may also need to distribute the read and write for geographic reasons. I could have engineers in two different cities in two different continents who both need to access the data, the same data, because it, you know, the company just wants to hire engineers in, uh, you know, around the world, and they all need to process the, the same data. So you may want to distribute access to that data, and you may also want to distribute the compute. 
again, when the compute can't fit on one server, I have many servers, and they may be in different data center, different parts of the same data center, or even entirely different data centers, and need to access that storage. And from a coherent standpoint, if I have multiple nodes, I usually need some kind of metadata consistency. Metadata usually tells me where the actual data is and what do I need to know about it, who's using it, uh, who has rights to it. That's all different types of metadata. And so the metadata has to live on either multiple storage servers or multiple clients or both. And so it has to be replicated very quickly. So we have the data itself, you can see in the diagram, being replicated. Uh, for backup or for remote access, and then the metadata is being replicated, and then you have clients that may access both the local storage or access across a LAN or WAN, or access storage on the other side of the network, or in fact in an entirely different continent. So that's why we say, you see all these left-right arrows here, there's a lot of east-west traffic in scale-out storage. All right, so I think I got ahead of myself and I talked a little bit about this slide already in terms of why I have different kinds of data replication. Uh, the internal or cluster network, and again, the cluster network and the client network uh, could be two physically separate networks, or sometimes they're the same network, uh, same physical network with two different sets of traffic. So the cluster network is for that replication, the metadata coherence, and for checking the health of knowing which servers have, are up and down. Uh, it can be Ethernet or InfiniBand or PCIe, or in a few cases, a proprietary uh, special network designed just for that storage system. The external network is how the clients, meaning the servers or the individual users, get to the data on the storage. And again, that can be Ethernet or a fiber channel or InfiniBand. In rare cases, it's something else, but it's usually one of those three. And then for the performance needs of this network, state that uh, if I have big files and sequential I.O., I usually need high bandwidth. If I have random I.O. or transactional I.O., which are typically databases or analytics or the internal metadata transactions, then I usually need low latency. So in many cases, scale-out storage, especially with flash, requires both high bandwidth and low latency depending on the workloads. Uh, and you may have different workloads going on. You may have one set of workloads on the client network and a different set on the cluster network. So that said, Take, I'll take a deep breath and I'd like to turn it back over to Fred and to Sakib to cover the network, networking requirements for Ethernet-based scale-out storage. Okay. Uh, Thank you, John. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hey, uh, Sakib, can you take over from here? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John, for uh, uh, your session. Uh, and let me move on to to discussing networking challenges for scale of storage, as well as looking at potential solutions to these challenges. Scale of storage networks require massive east to west performance and scalability. At the newer scale-out technologies, such as uh, software-defined storage, harvest disk resources across servers within a compute infrastructure and can often include external storage resources as well. The DAS in the compute nodes is presented to the compute infrastructure as a pool of storage resources, enabling any-to-any -any connectivity for storage traffic rather than compartmentalized storage infrastructures as in traditional non-scale-out environments. As some of these systems employ the concept of locality so as to minimize traffic across the network, a new layer of east-west traffic needs to be considered. And before we uh, be helpful to take a step back and, and look at what is TCP INCAST. TCP INCAST is a TCP throughput collapse that occurs as the number of servers sending data to a client increases past the ability of an Ethernet switch to buffer packets. The motivation for solving the TCP incast problem is the increasing interest in using Ethernet and TCP for high bandwidth, low latency, synchronized, and parallel applications. There's a strong desire to wire once and reuse the well-understood Ethernet TCP networking that is familiar in lower bandwidth networks. Are we... yes. 
sorry about you know, we're uh, having to scroll through the back. Yeah. So in terms of how TCP in cast affects storage networks or, or, or scale out storage networks, the many to one TCP in cast communication problem is, is a significant networking challenge for scale out storage networks. Specifically, if a host attempts to access data that is stored across multiple nodes, as seen in many software defined storage solutions, the storage nodes respond simultaneously to maximize parallelism. And this can cause an in-cast problem towards the requester. As well as when many hosts access the same storage device simultaneously, a massive in-cast condition happens at the storage device and on the intermediate network links. I apologize. I'm struggling with, I guess there's a delay on my side about forwarding, so I, I can't see the latest slide, but uh, yep. okay. So let's take a look at how networking speed mismatch can also affect the performance of scale-out storage networks. And today, many networks are a mixture of 1 gigabit, 10 gigabit, 40 gigabit, and 100 gigabit uh, links. This speed mismatch can cause a condition where a server is connected at 10 gigabit but the storage system is connected at 100 gigabit, for example. In this scenario, a single request sent at 10 gigabit, uh, but the responses from storage come back at 100 gigabit and must be serialized to 10 gigabit. This speed mismatch can lead to buffer exhaustion in a switch. And this results in drop packets, which degrades the performance of applications. As John discussed earlier, uh, low latency is a requirement uh, both for cluster networking in scale-out storage systems as well as for data access. And specifically, by spreading the functions of a storage array across many interdependent nodes, scale-out storage systems are inherently network latency dependent. The scale-out system has to not only provide data access to latency sensitive workloads, but also has to use this uh, network to tie together all those nodes to address two latency driven problems. The first is moving data between nodes for data protection, for example, in order to rebuild after a failure or to balance the system as nodes are added to the cluster. And the second uh, latency, network, uh, latency sensitive issue for cluster networking is how to deal with requests to node A for data that is stored on node B. In terms of uh, recommendations for how to deal with these challenges, the, the main or of one of the important aspects is uh, regarding the speed mismatch issue specifically, uh, it is important to ensure that packets are delivered, and this requires deep buffer switches, where, uh, especially where speed differentials occur in the network. And there are two possible solutions to deal with the TCP in cache challenge. The first is to increase the buffer size. However, the trade off here is that as you in uh, increase the buffer size, you also increase latency. The other approach is that when a switch detects congestion, it can mark the packet with an ECN bit, or sometimes called the diff serve field, at which point the end device can cut back its sending rate. And in terms of 
of east-west scalability, uh, what they require is leaf spine topologies with deterministic latency characteristics, any to any non-blocking host communication, and deep buffers capable of absorbing the largest of bursts and TCP in cache traffic patterns. And in terms of uh, enabling low latency communication among uh, nodes in a scale-out story system, as well as for data access, um, Ethernet RDMA networking has come to the fore as a solution to this challenge. Uh, network interface cards that connect servers and storage nodes in scale-out storage Ethernet networks enable RDMA or remote direct memory access to read and write data directly into memory locations in a remote uh, system. To support RDMA or Ethernet, a new class of NICs has emerged. These RDMA-enabled NICs, or sometimes called RNICs, offload Ethernet RDMA protocols, such as IWARP or Rocky, transmit the data at speeds up to 100 gigabit per second across the network encapsulated in an RDMA or Ethernet protocol while minimizing latency and host CPU utilization. The NVMe or Fabrics 1.0 specification includes support for Ethernet RDMA to efficiently transfer data from host to flash array and between scale-out flash storage nodes. That means that any NVMe or Ethernet RDMA fabric you choose should speed up your storage performance. And at this point, I would like to uh, turn the mic over to Fred uh, for the wrap-up uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Sankib. I think uh, that's a good, you know, um, summary here. Um, the key takeaway here is um, we can see scale out storage solution is getting more and more popular. We see a lot of deployment uh, nowadays, but scale out storage solution also expose a lot of challenges for networking, which means uh, the scale out storage solution is generating more east west traffic between those nodes. And also, we need higher bandwidth and lower latency, especially when we move to the all flash storage solutions. Uh, the latency actually is a critical requirement for the network. And we need to also uh, in, uh, uh, consider the in-cast and the speed mismatch in the whole network uh, when we have a scale-out solution, storage solutions. Um, when we choose the network, we need to look at, should I have a higher speed uh, uh, adapters for the storage nodes? Do we need to choose the modern switches with deep buffer and, and all those kind of you know latest technology to accommodate all those kind of you know considerations, or we have RDMA solution uh, that can do the direct data placement and those kind of DMA technology to mitigate the issue and provide a lower latency uh, a network. And again, if you have any questions, you can submit those questions online. Uh, and uh, since we have, still have some time, and we can answer those questions for you. OK. Before we close this uh, presentation, I want to do a little bit of commercial here to talk about the upcoming NSF webcast. We'll have virtualization and networking storage best practice in January 17th. 2019, and we'll have networking requirement for hyperconvergency, um, and that will happen in February 5th, 2019. You can see the registration link here on the slide. Uh, those are very exciting and uh, interesting topic, and please um, join us and register online. Also. Um, Please take a moment to rate this webcast and provide the feedback. We'll continue to improve our implementation. And you will find the recorded webcast and the PDF version of the slides on SNEA uh, NSF website. And we'll post the Q&A shortly after the uh, presentation. 
Again, follow us on Twitter at SNIA NSF. Fred, I, actually, I have a question that I thought we might discuss. Uh, so, so Keith talked about how one way to, with modern networks, you might be able to avoid some of the networking issues with speed mismatches. Uh, so, Keith, could you talk a little bit about how uh, congestion management could avoid some of these buffer issues? Yeah. So basically, uh, uh, a deep buffering in switches can, the way it can help the speed mismatch issue is that uh, it can uh, remove the risk of packets being dropped when you have uh, uh, the speed mismatch going on uh, between uh, clients and and uh, storage nodes. So uh, the, the buffers can can basically enable uh, delivery of streams in a lossless fashion because the packets are not going to be dropped because of uh, buffer sizing issues. So, so that's the primary way that that uh, uh, switches of uh, deep buffers can help in the speed mismatch uh, scenario. Right, that makes sense. Okay, thanks, Akib. So, with deep, if I have deep buffers on the switch, then that can help absorb the speed differences uh, from a speed mismatch and make sure we don't have drop packets. Uh, and then, I guess, if we implement some kind of congestion control mechanism, then if you have one, uh, you know, one node, one server, or one client that's sending too much traffic and it's overwhelming a buffer, then you could have that. Uh, I think congestion management could have tell that node to slow down to make sure that the buffer doesn't get too full or overloaded. Absolutely, and yeah, there's the ECN, basically a, a proactive way of uh, addressing uh, the speed mismatch, where the endpoint can can uh, be be signaled. To go slow down, as you said. Yeah. We've got an interesting. Sorry, we've got an interesting question from uh, online, which is better, Rocky or iWork? Oh, that's a popular question. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if we address that uh, within uh, the NSF, but uh, I would, I would say, to keep you can certainly comment. I would say that. Uh, both are supported by multiple network vendors. Uh, they both run on Ethernet. They both do RDMA. Um, certainly, the vendors be, who support them can argue about, uh, or have, have argued about which is better. Uh, so, Keith, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, you know, uh, so we did a webcast, I believe, recently on the topic, or that covered that topic in detail, and there's a blog post associated with that webcast that uh, folks can refer to. So as opposed to taking, uh, I mean, taking sides, the blog actually goes over different scenarios and, and, the, and the benefits of each. So I would refer people. I, I can't think of the name of the webcast that we did on this topic right off the top of my head, but that would what I would suggest to folks to take a look at. Uh, I believe it happened like October of, or maybe September. So Keith, that's a great idea. I think it was one of the Great Debates webcasts, and it was either called iWarp versus Rocky or Rocky versus iWarp, one of those. Exactly, yes. Right, yeah, so actually that's a great point. That's a webcast that specifically uh, addresses that question. Uh, we got another one. Um, and the thoughts on the MMU over Fabric with TCP IP? The availability and uh, what's the thoughts about that? Well, the uh, I understand that the standard is almost finalized. There's going to be finalized in the near future, and I think the SNIA uh, Network Storage Form NSF uh, might even do a webcast about it once the standard is out. Uh, certainly, it uh, promises the ability to get most of to get NVMe over Fabric's performance uh, by running over TCP/IP without RDMA. 
it's I, I would expect uh, personally I would expect the performance will be lower than if you use RDMA, but it's not yet clear whether it'll be a little lower or a medium bit lower or a tiny bit lower. Uh, but you would it would allow you to do it without having uh, without using RNICs. So I think that's the interest is that you can do NVMe over fabrics without RDMA. Uh, and the pri the and but the cost the cost so to speak is that the performance will be lower. How much lower uh, is not maybe not clear yet. So there have been some pre-standard uh, demos or tests. But I think that's a very uh, it's a very hot topic. And uh, it, it, this, again, the standard is not done, but it's supposed to be uh, done pretty soon. Yeah. yeah if I could just add, uh, yeah, it is a lot of interest and. Uh, uh, from an ease of use standpoint, from ease of deployment standpoint, as well as uh, there are different types of approaches for doing NVMe or TCP, uh, with different performance trade-offs. If or it's all done in software on both ends, there's one approach, but there is uh, the potential of having better performance, even as close to to NVMe or Fabrics RDMA performance, uh, if Specialized adapters that do TCP offloaded hardware are used on uh, uh, for VMA or TCP. So that's an area that I think would be helpful to monitor and to be looking at and stuff. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Akib, I I agree with that 100% with what you said 100%. Okay, uh, I think that's all for this presentation. Uh, any, anything else, uh, Fangjian or Sakib, you want to add? You know, Fred, usually somebody asks if they'll be able to uh, view the presentation, the recording, or download the slides. So maybe you could uh, address that. Yeah, uh, I, 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 uh, I said just now, uh, the presentation actually will be available on SNEAT website. Um, and we'll have the recorded uh, version of this web, web web presentation as well. Great, thanks, Fred. Okay. Thank uh, if no, thank you all for joining this uh, presentation, and we'll conclude the talk right now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.